Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, on behalf of the Thai Society of Endoscopic, Gynecologic Endoscopists, and also the Thai German Multidisciplinary Endoscopic Training Center, I would like to uh, welcome everyone to join our uh, monthly webinar. Today we will have a session that is very interesting about the uh, HIFU game changer of the urine fibroid and also uh, adenomyosis management. So as we know that uterine fibroid and adenomyosis are benign female disease that frequently affect about 40 to uh, 50 years old women presenting with a very uh, extent of clinical symptoms, such as an increased amount of the heavy menstrual bleeding, compressive symptoms, and also gradually aggravate uh, dysmenorrhea, which may uh, lead to sterility and also recurrent pregnancy loss. The common treatment include medical and also surgical approach. Minor invasive surgical technique as a laparoscopic myelopathy and also adenomyomectomy is quite common and maybe became a gold standard in in our day. However, uh, the a novel non-invasive treatment uh, for this common gynecological pathology as HIFU has been introduced uh, into China since the uh, 1990s with a good clinical efficacy by uh, many, many uh, paper published. So today we have a good opportunity to talk and also uh, deeply discuss on this uh, novel uh, non-invasive treatment uh, with our uh, two invited speakers. So uh, the first one is will uh, Dr. Olalik Muxikawong. Okay, what the uh, Professor uh, Olalik. So what is a mean uh, good afternoon or good day in Thai. So what? So what day? Kapajan So Olalik is a Thai obstetrician and gynecologist. He is currently working at uh, Japaya Pai Pupet Hospital in uh, Prajinburi, Thailand. Uh, Olik uh, has graduated uh, from Faculty of Medicine Konkan University in Thailand and attended professional classes of reproductive medicine at Lama Tipidi, uh, Hospital, Maidon University. He also attended uh, a fellowship laparoscopic training in uh, Kurachiki Medical Center, Japan, and also reproductive uh, surgery training course in Belgium. Moreover, uh, he received a master's degree in the biotechnology of human assist reproductive, reproductive and also embryology from University of Valencia in Spain. Regarding his uh, extraordinary achievements, he has been appointed in honorary position like a chair elected of a complementary and integrative medicine special interesting group of uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine and also a social media team leader of American Association of uh, Gynecologic Laparoscopists and also uh, honorarium advisor of health tech uh, startup society in Thailand. So let me uh, introduce uh, the second one. The second speaker in today is uh, Dr. Sevala. I also he taught in Sewa. Sewa Ja Supermanium. Sewa, uh, he is a consultant of statisticians and gynecologists and also a specialist in reproductive medicine at the uh, Makota Medical Center in Malacca. He also head of IVF center at this uh, hospital. 
He's a fellow of uh, the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He obtained his Master of uh, Workplace Medicine from UC of Western Sydney in 2003. He is a past of president of Obstetrics and Gynecological Society of Malaysia, a past president of APEC, and also a past board member of the ISGE. Clearly, he is a broad member of APGET and also a reviewer of journal of the Asia Pacific Society Association of Gynecological Endoscopy. So uh, he uh, is a dedicated laparoscopic surgeon, as we know. He has performed about uh, 8,000 cases so far. He also run a fellowship in minimally invasive surgery and infertility in Makota Medical Center, uh, the first of its kind in a private hostel in Malaysia. So far, he has uh, trained uh, nine uh, gynecologists. He published uh, uh, his uh, first book entitled Laparoscopic Surgery in uh, Gynecology and Common Disease in Women, a book uh, to educate the public and doctors on the benefit of laparoscopic surgery in women. He has also numerous publications in an international journal, mostly on the topic of minimal invasive surgery and fertility. He also runs a blog and a podcast entitled Surviving Private Practice in Malaysia. He just started the first uh, ultrasound based uh, high food center at a Makota Medical Center and will be provide non invasive surgery for fibroid and also adenomyosis. I think uh, today is, is a very good opportunity for us to, to uh, have uh, our two invited speaker to talk about the high food and also uh, might be uh, overview about the adenomyosis and also myoma uteri. So the first one is Olalik. We will talk about the overview about the myoma uteri and also HIFU and about 30 minutes. And then we will follow with a uh, uh, Dr. Selva to talk about the adenomyosis and also HIFU and also share his experience about the HIFU. I think we, today we will get a more, more uh, experience so finally, 30 minutes, we will uh, come to join together to talk and also uh, answer the question and some discussion together. Okay, uh, I think it's the time that uh, start. Okay, uh, Dr. Olarik, maybe uh, you start first. So can you hear me? Sure, sure. Good, very good. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Ampan, for a very kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Selwa. Mm -hmm. So uh, for uh, other doctor, if you want to remember uh, Dr. Selwa name, I also remember him, uh, Dr. Professor Selwa, Superman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very easy to uh, remember his name. Okay, so by the way, today I uh, will talk about the high food it is a game changer of uh, uterine fibroid management. Okay, and for uh, today's topic, I don't have uh, any uh, conflict of interest. Okay, so what is the my outline? I would like to talk about the high food is a game changer for who? I think the first one is uh, for the patient. The second one is for the provider or uh, the physician. And the last one is for the public. Okay, so why the high food is a game changer for the patient? Okay, so uh, as uh, Professor Ampan said, uh, uterine fibroid is a very common disease in the women. Uh, there is the data, this is published in, uh, in uh, USA, in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a survey mm -hmm. and uh, check about uh, the history of the antasa of the patient, why and back patient. So we know that uh, it's almost 80% of the back uh, patients have uh, uterine fibroid. So uh, this screen uh, 
this slide is show the estimate a specific commodity incident of a uterine fibroid in the black woman and white woman the age at 50 to uh, 49 years old you can see that it's almost 80 percent of the african american has a uterine fibroid and it's about 60 percent of uh, why women have the uterine fibroid but just only uh 50 percent of the patient have the uh, clinical relevant such as the abnormal uterine bleeding bulky symptom or the reproductive uh, problem and of course uh, in the why women have a uh, less clinical relevant i think it depends on the the incident of the fibroid if you have the lower incident of the fibroid you will have the less symptom is very uh, very uh, relevant so i would like to uh, say that uh, the uterine fibroid is uh, one disease but there's many symptoms this is my patient who have uh, at least uh, to a uh, fibroid anterior and posterior wall of the uterus so this is uh, one of the most common symptoms is uh, abnormal uterine bleeding we know that uh, thyroid can uh, uterine fibroid can cause like a uh, heavy menstrual bleeding can cause the uh, intermenstrual bleeding spotting mm -hmm. so this is very very common the second one is a bulky symptom uh, sometimes the fibroid is very big like uh, 20 uh, pregnant women 24 pregnant women and of course, I know uh, somebody have uh, experience like uh, the very big fibroids around uh, 30 centimeters that uh, show on the Thai newspaper. Mm -hmm. And of course, the patient have the symptom like uh, constipation, frequent uh, urinary retention. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, uh, the uterine fibroid can cause the pain, such as the uh, dysmenorrhea or uh, chronic pelvic pain and uh, some patients have a uh, ready a pain to the leg maybe a left or right or some patients have the low back pain and today i would like to focus about uh, reproductive dysfunction such as uh, recurrent pregnancy law miscarriage age or there is a problem about the uh, offsetting mm -hmm. such as the preterm labor uh, increase the number of uh, cesarean section and we know that in thailand we have the high uh, percentage of uh, cesarean delivery in thailand is about uh, 44 to uh, 50 percent of the c-section and uh, the bbh will say that uh, the c-section is over 15 percent is not necessary so uh, that is another project that i involved to decrease the unnecessary uh, cesarean delivery okay this is the publication of the ian fraser he is like a godfather of the heavy menstrual bleeding and as we know that uh, professor peter j he is the president of the seawood uh, the data is show the prevalence of uh, heavy menstrual bleeding in europe is about one fourth of the women have the problem about the heavy menstrual bleeding and this is the data in Turkey, uh, the incident of the heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, cause the, can decrease the quality of life is about 40% of the women. So this is my question. Actually, I, I will speak in Thai, but uh, Professor Ampan said there is uh, some uh, foreigner audience, so I have to uh, speak in English, but I would like to ask, the audience that so what do you think about your period this is uh too much do you have a uh, heavy menstrual bleeding or not so uh please reply on the chat the first one is normal the second one is uh, heavy menstrual bleeding or the third one is that you don't ever think about uh, the your period mm -hmm. so i cannot see the answer on the chat Dr. Ampan, are there any, any uh, audience uh, reply on the chat? Nope, nope, nope. But 
why I ask for this question because there is the publication in China, the prevalence and knowledge of the heavy menstrual bleeding among the outpatient. The question is uh, to by the WeChat. WeChat is like a chat application is very famous in China. Mm -hmm. There is more than uh, like a more than a thousand patient. Uh, we, okay, is a 1,152 patients uh, fill out this survey. Okay, that is about 78% of the patients have the heavy menstrual bleeding. So the question is uh, how they uh, calculate what is the heavy menstrual bleeding. They use the P-back. What is the P-back? P-back is a pictorial but loss assessment chart. Uh, if you use the pad, you have to check is uh, your periods is like moderate or complete of the pad. And this is a scoring. Uh, if you use the tampon, there is a scoring, or even you don't use uh, the pad or any tampon, if there is a somewhat clot, you can check it. You can uh, calculate until uh, the last day of your menstruation. So this is very uh, interesting uh, publication. That is uh, 68 patients, they answer uh, their menstrual is normal, but actually in the real life, uh, the PE back is more than uh, 100 score. If you have the heavy menstrual beating, uh, the PE back you are already uh, more than uh, 100 score. That means 68% uh, of the patient, they don't know that they already have the heavy menstrual bleeding. So I don't have the data in Thailand, but I think this may be uh, Dr. Pattaya, I think she's in uh, the, the, this room too. So uh, she will do uh, this uh, research in Thai patient because this is like a kind of, uh, in case the awareness for the, for the women, if you, have the problem, you have to come to uh, see the doctor very early. So um, most of most of the patients, they say they have the heavy menstrual bleeding when the payback is more than uh, 300. So th this is the big, big problem. So what is the impact of the anemia when uh, you have uh, heavy menstrual bleeding? Of course, it impacts the quality of life. It increases the emergency admission, increases the uh, blood transfusion, and increases the healthcare cost. And this is another important uh, publication they do in the five countries in Europe. It's more than uh, 30,000 uh, women. That 80% uh, of the women have the problem when they have the period. They cannot go to the school. They have uh, to like a uh, sick leave. For the for the workplace, so after this publication, there's a, there's a lot of company have the new policy for the sickly for the women who have the menstruation. I think if we are the policy maker, we have to think about this. So uh, back to our uh, clinical aspect, we know that uh, when uh, women have the abnormal uterine breathing, we have to approach by the palm coil polyps, adenomyosis, lyomyoma, malignancy, coagulopathy, ovation, dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic. And the, this is the large one, not otherwise classified. Mm -hmm. Today, I will focus on the lyomyoma. We know that in many years ago, we uh, categorized the lyomyoma only uh, in uh, three categories, submucous myoma, uh, intramural myoma, and uh, sub serous myoma, but we go have the more specific type of the myoma. Uh, they categorize to the egg type of the myoma, mm -hmm. type zero to uh, type eight. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we know that uh, one women they don't have the single myoma. Some patient have the multiple myoma, and some myoma is the hybrid type. So this is very, uh, very uh, complex disease. So I would like to focus on the second one is uh, uterine fibroid management. So what is the management for the patient? We know that uh, 
the history checking, the physical examination and investigation, every step is very, very important. In my opinion, I think uh, the history checking is one of the most important part. Same as the Professor Ampan always said that uh, you have to ask the patient, for example, if the patient have the pain, you have to ask that which side of your pelvis have the pain. Because sometimes we can understand see the fry boy on the right side, but uh, the patient have the pain on the left side. We have to very focus on the clinical not only on the investigation. Okay, this is the, the type of the uterine fibroid symptom health related questionnaire. Uh, I would like to suggest everybody to use this text box mm -hmm. used for in, uh, history taking and used for the follow-up because after the treatment, you can do the scoring for the patient. You, you can search on the internet. I'm not sure there is a translate in Thai. Uh, if uh, anybody want to translate in Thai, please let me know. I will use it for my patient too. Okay. And this is the second one from the fecal uh, system. Mm -hmm. We know that this is the palm coil system. I would like to uh, tell you that for the women who have the abnormal uterine beating, maybe they don't have only one disease. Some patients have a fibroid and they have the abnormal uh, ovulatory function. Some patients have a polyp with adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. So this is a checkbox again. You have to rule out every disease that can cause the abnormal uterine bleeding. If you check and you follow it, check yes. If you check it and you do not find it, check no. And if any cause you have not checked yet, you check question. Mm -hmm. You have to check all of the disease, the possible disease, possible cause. Okay. And this is the investigation uh, on the left side is uh, 2D ultrasound and on the right side is a 4D ultrasound. It's slightly bigger. Uh, I would like to recommend uh, of you uh, try to use the 4D uh, trivaginal ultrasound. It's very useful. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, sometimes we cannot see the type 0 or type 1 by the uh, 2D ultrasound. You have to do the SIS, satellite infusion sonography, to uh, uh, diag the type 1 or type C law of uterine fibroid. So this is uh, the type one of our two centimeters. Okay. Uh, and this is the MRI. Uh, we know that uh, in uh, many country in Japan, uh, in Europe, many countries they use the MRI for direct uh, uterine fibroid. Maybe uh, we can share with the uh, Dr. Waradin, he is in this room too. He is a trainee in France. He said that uh, all of the case, they do the MRI for the diagnosis of uterine fibroid. I, in my opinion, uh, for the patient who want to do the preservative surgery, I would like to recommend to do the MRI because we can do uh, the uterine mapping. We can uh, use it for the counseling the patient, which uh, Fibroid, we will take out. Fibroid, we cannot take out. Mm -hmm. And we can plan uh, the incision on the uterus. Because of one incision, we can take like a two or three fibroid in the one incision. That can decrease, uh, this, this can decrease the, the adhesion uh, post the surgery. So what is the treatment? We know that uh, we have the medical treatment and we have the surgical treatment. I think I have only uh, five minutes left. Uh, this is all, all of the medical treatment in the world we use. Mm -hmm. And this is the surgical and uh, intervention in the world we use. Mm -hmm. And today I would like to focus on the underside guide and 
we have a lot of time to discuss with the Professor Selva. What is the high four ultrasound guy? Okay, this is the diagram of the medical management of the abnormal urine beating P, A, and L. Okay, for the type one, we know that we can do the myomectomy by hysteroscope, laparoscope, or laparotomy. Mm -hmm. How about the type? How about the woman who want to have the future fertility? Mm -hmm. We know that the myomectomy by the laparoscope or laparotomy can uh, cause the uterine scar that can have the instant of a uterine rupture. So what? is the most proper intervention for the patient who want to have the baby in the future. Is it UAE? Is it HIFU? Or is it a radio frequency? We know that the data of the UAE uterine artery embolization, we, not, we do not suggest that for the patient who want to have the baby in the future because uh, when you have the when you do the embolization, it's not decreased just solely the fibroid, but it's decreased the blood flow to the endometrial cavity. Mm -hmm. So it can decrease the implantation rate when you do the IVF. So how about the high food? And this is the conclusion of the treatment of abnormal bleeding, medical and surgical. Okay. This is the, I think this one is the most important slide of my talk. This is a clear pen. This is a reproductive light clear pen for uterine fibroid. When uh, women have the history of a uterine fibroid, I mean a family history, we have to prepare since they have the main action. So what is the plan? We know that uh, we want to do like a plan A. Everything is very easy. Okay. Plan B is a little bit difficult, but in the real life, as we are the doctor, this is a plan C. It's like uh, many uh, complex situation. Some patients just only have the fibroid without uh, any uh, clinical issue, but some patients has. They have the abnormal bleeding, they have the bulky symptom, they have the pain. So we have to plan it until the menopause. So what is the high food? Oops. Okay. So what is the, the evolution of the surgery? Okay, we start at uh, conventional surgery. This is my picture when I was uh, in the second year of the resident in uh, Udon Thani Hospital. It's an uh, elective. It's uh, the best time of my life. The first surgery mm -hmm, by myself. Okay. And then uh, we moved to a laparoscopic procedure. Mm -hmm. And now I, this is a high food era. The doctor don't need to stand for a long time. Just sit on the, in front of the computer and just click. Oops. Okay. Oops. So what is the high food? This is the principle of a high food is that we have the transducer, they convert the electric energy into acoustic energy and it destroy the tissue because uh, they have focus points. The focus point is uh, the temperature is rising over 65 degree and uh, reversible coagulative necrosis of the tissue. Oh, I, I have no idea why, why my slide is too fast. Okay, and this is the focus point. The focus point is around uh, one centimeter. You can see the transducer uh, uh, use the acoustic power mm -hmm. pass the skin to the tissue. Just uh, you use the ultrasound guide. We have the two type of of the guidance. Uh, Professor Silva will talk about it, it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the high food operation room? 
it's just uh, only the small room five uh, times five made, just only one machine, uh, computer, uh, an aesthetic machine. So this this is the hospital that I have the uh, the chance to attend the operation. This is the hospital in Barcelona. It's about what, 300 hospital. Uh, it's far from the downtown, about uh, 50 uh, minute by car. Mm -hmm. You can see just only four uh, staff in that uh, room. One is the doctor. Mm -hmm. He's a gynecologist. One is an anesthesiologist. One nurse, and one uh, staff who like a uh, circulating uh, staff. Mm -hmm. Just only for staff that you need in this operating room. Okay, but and the patient is lie down on the machine. They use uh, anesthetic, the light anesthetic. You can wake the, the patient up anytime you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the high full beam attack the tissue, you can see the immediate effect post the treatment, just only one day. Mm -hmm. The average annual absorption rate is almost uh, 70%. This is the meta-analysis by uh, Dr. Lu. They conclude that uh, after do the high food, the better quality of light, better uh, usually in fibroid symptom, mm -hmm. and the time to return to work is shorter than uh, laparoscope. The, the duration of hospital, hospital stay is very short. In Spain, they do like uh, one day surgery, just only an OPD case, just uh, come to hospital in the morning and in the afternoon, you can go back to uh, to your house. Okay, and this is, I would like to focus is a pregnancy outcome after the other side guy, Haifu. Uh, he is a publisher, Professor Jordi Lodi guest. Mm -hmm. Actually, he is the oncologist who do the laparoscope too. He do the Haifu uh, two day a week. Mm -hmm. And he has uh, experience more than 10 years. This is the publication in uh, 2019. Is a retrospective study. They uh, collect the data since uh, 2008 to uh, 2018, analyze the pregnancy outcome of the patient. Okay, so uh, there is a 70 uh, pregnancy in uh, 55 patients. And uh, 68, uh, 58 case is a uh, natural conception and uh, 13 was uh, by the IVF. So the median time of the conception is about uh, one year. Why we choose the high pool? Because we know that when, do, when we do the operation, there is a lot of the uh, complication. Uh, you can buy this book online. Mm -hmm. The five ball utilize the surgical challenge in a minimal access surgery mm -hmm. is about uh, 200 bucks. And uh, I have uh, one chapter. It's, it's, it is about the bridge of the endometrial cavity during the myomectomy and its implication for the subsequent fertility. Mm -hmm. Because we know that uh, when we do the, the my omectomy is about 50% of the operation have the complication of the, of the endometrial cavity. So we have very careful if patients want to have the baby in the future. Okay, by the way, back, back to that uh, uh, publication uh, by the Dr. Jordi. This is the image of the 30 years old women have the vaginal uh, delivery, delivery after doing the high food. You can see this is a big one as the posterior part of the uh, uterus. And after doing the high food, you can see on the picture D. It's almost 80% of the volume of the fibroid already decreased. And the patient have the normal uh, natural conception. And this is another case. 
you can see in this uh, MRI, it is very difficult to do the operation in this type of the, the fibroid. How we remove this uh, myoma? In my opinion, it's not possible. My, my, on my hand, maybe uh, if you have the, the experience, you can do the, the surgery. Um, you know, three years ago, we have the medication, uh, the UPA that can decrease the volume, but now it's already with the, on the market because there is the, the liver damage. So, uh, what is, I will try to treat the patient for now. GNIS agonist. Mm, in my opinion, maybe uh, some patient is, is not very, uh, it's not very uh, eff effective. Mm -hmm. So what is the option? So uh, I think uh, I'm uh, running out of time. I will uh, stop uh, my talk. Oh, okay. This is another one I would like to talk is a game changer of the phys physician. Uh, there's the data of the prevalence of the work related of Moscow, Moscow, musculoskeletal disorder of the surgeon. This is the meta-analysis. There's a uh, degenerative, so, so we call spine, rotator cuff, lumbar spine, carpal tunnel syndrome. And if we forgot on the gynec surgeon, is this the same outcome? There is a lot of the pain on the back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, wrist. If you do the operation for a long hours, you have more uh, symptoms. And this is uh, another uh, publication for the laparoscopy, Dr. Ampan, <laughs> associated with the increase the risk of uh, what about this prolapse. It's about 20% uh, of the of the staff who do the laparoscopy have this symptom and they have to do the treatment, definitive treatment. Uh, by the way, okay, they, if you can find a chair, you can sit on the chair. Mm -hmm. This is a picture in uh, Shanghai. I attend. Uh, she is a professor Liu. Uh, in this hospital, there is a 32 operating room. There is more than 60 laparoscopic cases per day, per day. And every operation room is a 3D uh, machine. So, uh, I would like to stop my talk for now. So please, uh, Professor Silva. Okay, uh, Dr. Oradik, very nice talk. And okay, I, I think the game changer is quite interesting What And I think uh, Dr. Silva might be one of the solution because uh, Silva does a lot of blood process surgery in myoma and also adenomyosis. And now I think he changed, I'm not sure if it would change or not, <laughs> to be, uh, to do only high food. I think it's got some condition like a, it's a proper for the high food and also the proper for the laparoscopic surgery. So uh, Sewa, please. Um, thank you, Ampan. Have you, uh, uh, can you see the screen, my screen? Sure, sure. Yes, so I can start. Eh? Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Thai Society for inviting me to give this lecture. So uh, my topic actually will be mostly on adenomyosis, but uh, I, I realized that maybe I will touch a little bit on uh, fibroid as well. Now, now this uh, is my disclosure. I run this Haifu uh, Center at Makuta Medical Center, and we have been doing it for about eight months now. Now, let me give you one example. Uh, this lady is a 39-year-old lady. She, she's married for nine years with no children. She has adenomyosis with severe period pain and heavy menses. She has been admitted for blood transfusion many times because of severe bleeding. Now, she saw me in February 2019, and this was what we found on ultrasound. It's a large adenomyotic nodule, 6.8 times 6.1 centimeters. So uh, I discussed with her, I said, what are options? Options are either doing hysterectomy or HIFU. I mean, adenomyomectomy is another choice, but uh, we, we, we thought it would not be suitable for her. So she, she said she will wait for HIFU. But uh, because of the pandemic, everything delayed was delayed. And um, 
So uh, ultimately, she gave up and she underwent a laparoscopic hysterectomy. This is a laparoscopic hysterectomy. I just put it up just to uh, show you all um, that I also do laparoscopic hysterectomy. Uh, so this is a fairly large uterus up to almost 16 to 18 week size. And I think the uh, TLH, everybody does TLH, but uh, uh, be, uh, for adenomyosis, it can be uh, fairly difficult. So this is the adenomyosis. So here I'm just suturing the uterine artery uh, on the right side. And then uh, the uh, this is suturing the uterine artery on the left side. And uh, so the, the, the technique is, I think, standard. It is now everyone, everyone does this surgery. So here I'm cutting the vagina. Now, uh, here I'm using a harmonics to uh, remove, uh, detach the uterus. And because the uterus was so large, it, it's very difficult for me to mosulate from the vagina, like a narrow vagina. So I use a knife to actually cut this uh, uterus. So here I've already detached the uterus. And then I use a knife to cut it because it makes it, it make me easier for me to um, remove it from the vagina. So this, as you can see, this is a very large adenomyosis. Uh, and uh, it has to be cut into many pieces, and then you also, also have some small fibroids, and then the pieces were then slowly removed from the vagina. And after that, the, uh, you, the vaginal wall was then sutured. Um, this is standard. I think all of you all know this, and uh, we all do this surgery. We've been doing this for years. Uh, so here, I, I, I usually like to suture it uh, in an interrupted manner. Um, and uh, so that, that is the whole surgery. And the uh, uterus was, uh, this, uh, this is how it looked at the end of the surgery. So the uterus was this, this was the uh, size, it was not that big, 600 plus gram, but uh, this, that is what happened to this patient. So um, I bring this up because this is not uncommon. A lot of women up with severe pain, severe dysmenorrhea, ultimately give up and then they have a hysterectomy. So uh, how can HIFU help in this patient? That's a whole discussion for this patient. Now, when we look at adenomyosis, there are two ways in which we diagnose adenomyosis. The first is by ultrasound, and then the second is by MRI. Now, we, we, in, by ultrasound, we generally uh, distinguish adenomyosis as either diffuse adenomyosis, focal adenomyosis, or adenomyoma. And this is a book, uh, I recommend this book, it's a very nice book written by my friend Felix Wong on adenomyosis. And if you look at ultrasound diagnosis, there are six criteria for ultrasound diagnosis of uh, uh, myoma. Many of us never use all six. The first we always do is one, one part is uh, uh, thicker than the other. There is a thickening of one section, usually it's a posterior, but sometimes it can be the anterior. If you can have this kind of small cyst, you can have these lakes of adenomyosis, and these are the ones that uh, I will tell you all later, that's very difficult to treat with HIFU. You can have this kind of lines, which are fan-shaped shadowing, and then echo, echogenic subendothelial lines, you may be able to see. You can also see this vascularity and also irregular junctional zones like this or interrupted junctional zones. But most of us will probably see these three, which is thickening, cyst, and these legs, maybe some vascularity. So this is ultrasound diagnosis of endometriosis. Now, for MRI, is more, more uh, interesting because there are many uh, categories. We also say it as diffuse, but they, they categorize uh, adenomyosis as internal adenomyosis, external adenomyosis, and adenomyoma. And this is all the criteria that they have, the MRI classification of adenomyosis. So the first adenomyosis is called internal adenomyosis. That is adenomyosis in the center. Usually, it's a thickening of the junctional zone, this A, B, C, D, R, internal adenomyosis, uh, various form of thickening of the junctional zone. Then you come to uh, 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 you come to diffuse adenomyosis, which is called, this is a diffuse adenomyosis, which is D and E are diffuse adenomyosis. Then you have something called internal, then you get something called adenomyoma, which are actually nodules. It can be seen in the uterus. It could be either in the intramural, subserous, or even in the cavity. And these are the ones that are uh, G, H, and I. We can also see in subserous. And the last one is called external adenomyosis. And these are the most difficult ones. They are, they are actually found outside and they infiltrate into the rectum. And you can have anterior one that infiltrates into the bladder. So in, in adenomyosis by MRI, you've got different classifications. And when we treat adenomyosis, especially even in HIFU, each type of adenomyosis will have different effects and uh, success rate when we do treatment. 
So when we look at adenomyosis patients, we actually have two groups of patients. The first are the ones who do not want to conceive. Either they have already have enough children or they don't want to have children, and but they want to retain their uterus. This, this is one group. Of course, patients with adenomyosis, we all know that we can actually remove the uterus and they will be well. But these are patients who actually do not want to conceive, but they want to retain the uterus. The second group are the ones that are most difficult, which are those with adenomyosis, and they have infertility or they want to conceive. And these are the ones that are big and problematic. And this is the ones that I see because I'm a fertility specialist. And these are the patients that always land up with me and I don't, don't know what to do with them before. So for those who do not want to conceive, we have many methods of treatment. We can use oral contraceptive pills. We can use Dinogest. We can use Depo Provera. We can use Mirena. We can do give intermittent GNRH uh, injection, or finally we can do hysterectomy. So this is this is option is available. So many of them, I've got many patients who are on Depo Provera injection for years, and they are very well. Some of them do well with Mirena. And uh, uh, Dinogest also, some patients do well, and even, even continuous oral contraceptive, some people do well with, uh, uh, with uh, adenomyosis. But those who want to conceive, we have a problem. So what are, we can't give any of the hormonal, uh, hormonal treatment. So we only have a choice. We only have adenomyomectomy, or we can give generic analog or Dinogest and then try see whether the patient can get pregnant on their own, or we can do IVF and do fungal embryo transfer. So these are the patients that uh, will probably benefit a lot from what I'm going to discuss in a little while. So now what is HIFU? Um, Dr. Olarik has already mentioned a little bit. It means that we are using uh, uh, ultrasound, we use this for ultrasound to focus the ultrasound beam and to ablate the adenomyosis. And I'll just show you a video on this that will explain to it. An ultrasound beam can be brought to a tight focus at a distance from its source. Sufficient energy concentrated within the focus. The cells lying within will be killed without damaging the surrounding tissues. High-intensity focus ultrasound, by food, is, therefore, a non-invasive method of producing selective and trackless destruction of deeply seated tissue targets within the body without causing any damage to the overlying surrounding tissue. So that's that's how HIFU works. So um, I, I would like to tell you all that there are actually two different types of HIFU. The first is called an MRI-based HIFU, and uh, it's made by Philips and GE. And this is how it looks. It's a tunnel where the, it, the patient goes into this, and then the HIFU is done. And the other one is the ultrasound-based HIFU. This is the, the leader is actually uh, the HIFU company by Chongqing China. And uh, this is what I am doing now. So I'm going to give some idea of what these two difference is. When I first uh, heard about HIFU, because MRI-based HIFU has been available in Malaysia for more than 15 years, but we know we, we never really uh, took took uh, up took it, it it never became popular because of some of the problems the technical problems we have in MRI based HIFU and I always thought that it was not very good so that's the reason why when ultrasound based HIFU was introduced to me I was very reluctant until uh, I was convinced by my friend Dr Lee Kin Wai in, in Singapore that it is a very good product and it is very beneficial and that's why we started this treatment in um, in Malaysia. Now, this is the difference between MRI-based HIFU and ultrasound-based based HIFU. You can see that the probes are different. Here you can see this is the uh, ultrasound-based HIFU probe, and this is the MRI-based HIFU, HIFU probe. The MRI-based HIFU transition movement is limited by the size of the hole in the gentry of the MRI. Ultrasound-based HIFU movement transition is not limited. And this ultrasound-based HIFU can actually move six centimeter this way, six centimeter this way, six up and six down. And that is a big advantage. Whereas this one doesn't move, it is just a, a, a static uh, HIFU machine. Another difference is that MRI-based HIFU uh, use phase array transducer. So the advantage of this is that the focus can be moved without movement of the transducer. Now to move a transducer in the ultrasound-based HIFU, you have to move the whole transducer. Whereas here, you, they, they are made of 265, uh, 56 small focal points. So there are many focal points, and these focal points can be moved. So that you can actually move the, the, the beam from one place to another without moving this gantry. So, but the intensity of the uh, concentration of the focus is not good, and so the power of the machine is limited. That's with MRI-based HIFU. As opposed to ultrasound-based HIFU, we're using a single element transducer, so the, the, the machine is very powerful, 
and the focus is very small and intense. So this one big advantage of ultrasound-based SIFU compared to MRI-based SIFU. So the MRI-based SIFU uses lower power and has a longer sonication time. So each sonication could take 10 to 20 seconds, which is not very suitable for an organ that moves like uterus. So it is, it, it is not good for a static organ. It may be good for a static organ like your brain. So for this, what you do is you fix the point and then you wait for 10 to 20 seconds for the energy to reach there. Here, it is not like that. We do it second by second. We are doing it live. That is the difference between these two. So for a, for a uterus, especially in a patient who is breathing, the uterus moves and the, even the, the focal point moves. The ultrasound-based HIFU is far superior than that of the MRI-based HIFU. So uh, let me go on to the next slide. So therefore, the advantages of an ultrasound-based HIFU is that it is real-time ultrasound imaging when, when we perform ultrasound, when we perform HIFU with ultrasound-based HIFU. The transducer is larger and more powerful and better transducer movement during the HIFU treatment, also a shorter operating time, and also better success rate. This is most important. You can get a very high percentage of NPV, which is the non-perfusion volume with the ultrasound-based HIFU as opposed to the MRI-based HIFU. This has been proven with many, many studies. Now, let's look at adenomyosis. What, will high, what are the benefits of high food for adenomyosis? And this also applies to fibroid. It is non-invasive. When the shrinkage of adenomyosis occurs, the uterus will become smaller and it will be more uh, uh, amenable for pregnancy, especially for IVF and also patient to conceive on her own. There is reduction of symptoms such as menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea. The patient can start conceiving early, even after four months of treatment. And the patients can even have a normal delivery after the treatment because there's no scar in the uterus. I'll, I'll elaborate on this in a little while. But what are the challenges we face when we do high food treatment uh, for adenomyosis? In patients who do not want to conceive, we can use extensive ablation can be performed. And this can include even the endometrial cavity. So the success rate of reducing system is higher in these patients. Whereas in patients who want to conceive, the ablation will need to be done more carefully to avoid ablating the endometrium. In this case, the ablation will be limited and the success in reducing symptom will be lesser as less energy will be given to the adenomyotic areas. So when I talk to my patients, sometimes they are trying for years, 42 year old, they are trying for years and they have a severe pain, they have got menorrhagia. I ask them, do you want to get pregnant? Because the way in which we do the ablation will be different. They say, I am not interested in pregnancy anymore. Then we can do ablation very extensively and treat as much of the disease as possible. But if they say, yes, I still want to get pregnant, then we need to do the ablation in a more careful manner so that it doesn't involve the endometrium and, 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 and uh, the only the uh, certain part of the adenomyosis can be treated. So patients, another problem is patients with prior surgery. There may be intestines adherent to the uterus, and this may be in the part of the high food beam. And so such cases, we cannot do high food. And many of my patients who see me have already undergone surgery. They would have had a myomectomy before, or adenomyomectomy before, or some kind of surgery before. And we are always looking for intestines, whether it's stuck to the anterior wall of the uterus, especially where the beam is going to go through. And if there is any such, we can't do. So this is an example. This lady had a large, uh, uh, this fibroid case, actually multiple fibroids, and she had previous myomectomy. And you can see the intestine is actually stuck in front here. So in this kind of patients, we can't do it. This is, I did a laparoscopy for her. And you can see all the bubble are adherent to the anterior wall. So these are the patients that we, we will not be able to do uh, high food for these patients. And here, these patients, I, I did a, a laparoscopic myomectomy again after releasing all these adhesions. So let me just go through my experience performing high food for the last eight months. I started on the 12th of July, 2021. And until yesterday, we have done 163 cases, 82 adenomyosis and 81 fibroids. It's caught up. In fact, at the beginning, I was doing more adenomyosis. Now, fibroids are catching. Actually, fibroids are very nice to do. They are, because the fibroids are actually localized. They are in, in a capsule. So the energy will be within the capsule. So it's far more easier to do fibroids than adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is far more difficult because they are all over the place. And some and as I told you all earlier, MR, on MRI, there are different, different types of adenomyosis. That's internal, external, diffuse adenomyoma, and they all don't react the same way. So adenomyosis, the success rate is far more difficult than fibroids. So this is uh, my HIFU center. It is a, it's a small room, not, uh, not that big a room. And uh, we place the machine in the, the center here. And this is our console. And I'll be sitting here talking to the patient here. This is our water system and uh, the power system. So it's a small, small setup in the hospital, uh, in, in a private hospital in the fifth floor of this hospital. 
So next, I'll just go through some questions that people ask about adenomyosis. Now, first question is, does adenomyosis cause infertility? Everybody say yes, it does. And I think um, almost everybody listening will say that you, you must be crazy to ask this question. Of course, adenomyosis causes infertility. And this paper says so. Yes, the patients with adenomyosis have significantly high rates of spontaneous abortion, lower rates of implantation, clinical pregnancy and live birth, and poorer obstetric outcome. But I was surprised to see this uh, paper in ASHRAE, which was published quite recently and it, in, in 2021, and it, it, it's entitled The Impact of Adenomyosis on IVF Outcomes, a Prospective Cohort Study. And the researchers came to a conclusion that when they looked at women with and without adenomyosis having IVF, they found no difference in chances of giving birth to a live baby. So it doesn't matter if your patient has got adenomyosis or not, but uh, uh, when, when I see patients, they are actually, most of them have already undergone IVF and failed the IVF. And that's when they send them to me to see whether I can help shrink the adenomyosis uh, for the patient and then do a second embryo transfer. The next question to ask is, how does adenomyosis cause infertility? There are many reasons. The first obvious reason is that the uterus is very large and there's abnormal anatomical structure. The uterus is, the endometrium is uh, in, not in the proper way. It is, is a convoluted. That may cause the, the difficulty in conceiving. Another reason is the thickened junctional zone. When the junctional zone is involved, it causes a lot of uterine peristalsis. And when there's uterine peristalsis is high, then the patient will not have implantation. Adenomyosis is also an inflammatory process. Anything that is inflammatory will know that they, we know that the pregnancy rates are lower. And also there may be endometrial dysfunction due to some sex hormone synthesis in the endometrium. And lastly, there may be prolactin levels may be higher in adenomyosis. So these are all the reasons why patients with adenomyosis have difficulty in getting pregnant. So what options do we have if a patient with adenomyosis who want to conceive? We can either do IVF and ICSI. Many of them actually go through this process, IVF, ICSI. And after the IVF ICSI, if the frozen embryo transfer is done and they didn't get pregnant, many of them give GnRH analog or Dynogest for maybe three, six months, and then let it shrink down and then do the, uh, do the frozen embryo transfer or ask them to get pregnant. This is another strategy for patients with adenomyosis. Now, another, the last resort is actually adenomyomectomy. Adenomyomectomy is a surgery that I don't like to do because always I'm not sure how much I'm cutting and how how uh, well have I uh, reconstructed the uterus? And the last is now this high intensity focus ultrasound. So let me look at the difference between adenomyomectomy and HIFU for patients who, are, who want to get pregnant. The advantage of adenomyomectomy is that if you remove the adenomyoma, if there is a focal adenomyoma, we can cut it out and it is taken out. In adenomyos, in HIFU, the advantages, as you know, there's no scar in the uterus, the uterus will shrink. There's no skin incision. There's no anesthesia. We do it just under sedation. It can be done as a daycare procedure. The patient can go back to work early and the patient can conceive after four to six months. Now, and also you can repeat it. If it, if it recurs, you can repeat the high food treatment. Now let's look at disadvantage. You know that uh, when we do adenomyomectomy, there's a scar in the uterus. There's a risk of uterine rupture when the patient gets pregnant. This is what I am always worried about. If I do an adenomyomectomy, if the patient gets pregnant, I'll be worried until she delivers whether the uterus is going to give way or not. It's usually a very difficult surgery, and also it can be done. We, we can do it for focal adenomyosis but, and adenomyoma, but not for global ad ad adenomyosis. You can see you can't do adenomyomectomy for these kind of patients. Maybe for this, 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 and this, you can do, ad uh, you can do ad adenomyomectomy, but not for um, a diffuse kind of adenomyosis. And it's also very difficult to repeat it. You can't be doing adenomyomectomy over and over again for a patient. So this disadvantage of HIFU is that not all patients are suitable to undergo HIFU. I will discuss about this in a little while. You may not be able to ablate the, the lesion. It, it, sometimes the position, the, the, the way the patient, the uh, adenomyosis is, if we are not able to ablate. And another problem is ablation may not be in, may be incomplete. You cannot completely do the ablation because of several reasons. It may recur. And if the adenomyosis involves the endometrium, part of the endometrium may be ablated. This, this has happened before. I, I'll show you this because we try our best not to involve the endometrium, but sometimes you cannot avoid because the adenomyosis has already gone right through and into the endometrium. And so it may be uh, inevitably uh, ablated. So the next question is, uh, uh, in this study, they showed, they tried to look at adenomyomectomy or HIFU, a comparison of reproductive outcomes of patients with adenomyosis uh, and infertility with high intensity focus ultrasound and laparoscopic excision. And it is uh, uh, done by the department ONG in Changsha 
China, and they concluded that HIFU shows a safe and effective profile as a therapeutic management option for patients with adenomyosis in comparison with laparoscopic uh, excision. HIFU treatment achieve a better post-operative reparative outcome treatment should be encouraged and implemented in clinical practice. So there is, in this study, they say that there's a role for HIFU for patients with adenomyosis. Next question people ask is, does HIFU affect ovarian function? And this study has clearly shown that they did AMH before and after HIFU for patients with fibroids and adenomyosis, and they found that the AMH level is the same. So the HIFU does not involve ovarian function because when we are focusing the beam into the uterus, the ovaries are far away from the area where we are focusing in there. And we usually have a margin, at least a one, at least 15 millimeters margin from the serosa when we do, when we do this ablation. Now, does, the, another question is, does the HIFU affect endometrium? So again, when we are doing HIFU, we are actually shining a beam into the uterus, sometimes through the endometrium to the posterior wall. If the anterior wall, we don't go to the endometrium, but if it's a posterior wall, we are shining through the endometrium. Will there be any effect to the endometrium? In this study, they, what they did is they took endometrial sampling from, the, uh, from a patient before HIFU, and then they took it uh, after HIFU, and they found that it did not reveal any negative effects uh, of HIFU ablation of uterine fibroids on endometrial receptivity in women with reproductive age. So what are the risks of patients uh, of HIFU for patients uh, with adenomyosis who want to conceive? As I say, they, they, I always tell my patients there are three things that I'm worried about. First is bowel injury. Bowel injury is when you're uh, uh, shooting, the, bowel, uh, shooting the, uh, the HIFU, you must not have bowel in the way. And we have got several ways to push the bowel away, especially uh, on the, what we call as the head side of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uterus. The second is nerve injury. Now, we know that when we shoot a HIFU beam, there is some, uh, uh, some uh, energy that will go behind and may irritate the nerves. So we are always talking to the patient to make sure that they don't have any nerve involvement. And that's the reason why we do HIFU under sedation. The last is skin burn. Now, skin burn, especially in patients with multiple skin uh, incisions, there is a tendency that the scar will absorb the incision. Again, this is another advantage of doing HIFU under sedation because we're constantly talking to the patient. We are asking the patient whether they feel any pain in the, in, on the skin. And also the, so the whole HIFU is done with a patient lying in a, in a bowl full of cold water. The temperature is uh, around 14 to 16 degrees. So that will cool down the skin. So the risks of these two are actually very low and bowel is actually very, very low. It's only two in 10,000. Now, the next worry is incomplete ablation. Now, what is incomplete ablation? Now, if I can give you an example, like this is an example of an adenomyosis case that I, re I did recently. This patient has got not a very big adenomyosis, a small adenomyosis, and it's anterior, but she has these big, big legs. And when you have these kind of big legs, the ablation can be very difficult. And after completing the ablation, I only got very little ablation of this. So this was incomplete ablation uh, because of the disease that the patient had. How much energy I gave the, the adenomyosis didn't die off. And the third uh, uh, risk is that ablation involving the endometrium. As I told you all earlier, this is a kind of adenomyosis. This adenomyosis is completely involving the endometrium. This whole wall of the endometrium is involved. Which I've got a hystroscopic finding for this. I forgot to put it up. The, this is an, in, this is an in, internal adenomyosis that has involved the endometrium. So when we are ablating this, our aim is actually to avoid this. But sometimes it can be very, very difficult. And you can see when I'm ablating it, it has reached the endometrium here. So this is one of the risks. But whatever it is, I think I've done service to this patient because the endometrium is already involved. And so I'm hoping that this will die off and new endometrium will, will form and the patient will be able to get pregnant. So these are the risks of HIFU for adenomyosis on patients who want to conceive. So when should HIFU be considered in a patient who wants to conceive? This is the question I always ask when the patient come and see me and they are infertile, they have adenomyosis, should I do HIFU for them? Now, what are the options these patients have? Now, the first option is if the patient have done IVF and have failed several times, so, and then they, the IVF specialist send the patient to me, now, can you do something about this adenomyosis? Maybe she's not getting pregnant because of this adenomyosis. Then I will li liberally do HIFU for them. Many of my patients are like this. They are sent to me by IVF specialists or my own patients who have not got pregnant after IVF, then we do HIFU for them. Next patient is a patient, of course, who suffers severe dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia and also want to get conceived. So these patients, 
their pain is so bad, they say, I want to get this treatment to try and reduce the, uh, the pain and the menorrhagia and then help them to get pregnant. The third patients are patients with adenomyosis and infertility, but not keen to, to do IVF. We have good, this kind of patients. The patients are young, say they are in the early 20s or, or early 30s. They have adenomyosis, they cannot get pregnant, but they don't want to do IVF. And so they say, okay, can you help to kill this adenomyosis for me? Uh, shrink it I can, so that a uterus can shrink and the patient can get pregnant. So this is another group of patients whom I do HIFU for them. Now, these are many studies that showed uh, pregnancies after HIFU. The first such study is by uh, is actually MRI-based HIFU by this person, Rabino Vici, and he had one pregnancy. And then you have uh, Dr. Kim from Korea who had one pregnancy here. Ms. Dr. Lo has 15 pregnancy. Dr. Lee from Korea has nine, but unintended pregnancies. Uh, Dr. Zhou, 54 pregnancies, and Dr. Wang has 20 pregnancies. And in all these pregnancies, they, especially here, there's no uterine rupture during the pregnancy. And, the, and many of these patients actually had normal delivery, uh, 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 spontaneous delivery. Here you can see that out of these 20 pregnancies, 11 had normal delivery. So this is one of the advantages when you do HIFU, instead of doing adenomyomectomy, the patient can attempt to have a normal delivery. So what to do if a patient has both endometrioma and adenomyosis? What are you going to do? This is another dilemma I always have. Now, this patient has got a big adenomyoma, five centimeters or six centimeters. You also get adenomyosis. Now, which one am I going to do first? Uh, so I, I think it depends on the age of the patient. If the patient is young, um, and I will, I will probably deal with the endometrioma first and see whether she can conceive on her own. If the endometriosis is not so bad, but the endometrioma is big, then I will do the surgery and then see whether she can conceive on her own. If she cannot conceive, then we can consider IVF. And then if the IVF fails, then we do HIFU. Or we can even do HIFU after the endometrioma. So I'll, I'll have a long discussion with the patient to see why she's not getting pregnant. Is it because of the endometrioma or is it because of the adenomyosis or is it because of both? And then we will decide which to do first. If the patient is older, uh, say in late 30s and early, early 40s, then I actually suggest them to do IVF uh, if the endometrium is not so large and freeze all the embryos. Then we can consider what to do. We can either do a frozen embryo transfer or do a surgery followed by frozen embryo transfer, or we can consider GNRH followed by a frozen embryo transfer. And if all fails, then do HIFU. So these are something that I will discuss with the patient, which, which is the best way to do. I'm not saying that we must do HIFU for all our patients, but this is another option for that patient. So another, another question people ask me is, should you give GNRH analog before HIFU or after HIFU? Our protocol uh, follows Chongqing's protocol, which is we do, you know, we do HIFU and then we give them GNRH for three months. And if the patient doesn't want to get pregnant, we will put in a marina for them. If the patient wants to get pregnant, then they either uh, go for a frozen embryo transfer or try to get pregnant on their own. In this particular study, they showed that uh, the combination of uh, HIFU and GNRH is more effective than HIFU alone for ablation of diffuse and adenomyosis. So moreover, GNRH pre-treatment uh, with HIFU is safe. So the, the question to ask is, should we give GNRH before we do HIFU? So that is the question. If the, if, uh, some, some of the doctors feel that if the adenomyosis is so large that you are going to do the HIFU, it's going to take a long time, then shrink it with GNRH and not for three months and then do the HIFU. Uh, if the adenomyosis is not so big, I usually don't give GNRH. I just go ahead and do the high food for, for the patient. Yeah, in, this, in this book, uh, Focus Ultrasound Surgery, uh, also edited by Dr. Felix Wong, they say that some patients should have GNRH analog before or after high food treatment, especially those with large adenomyosis lesion with rich blood supply. It is a good idea to be aware of the challenges of high food treatment in large adenomyosis lesion. The GNRH treatment reduces the size and the blood supply of the adenomyosis. In turn, it, this will reduce the treatment difficulty and improve the effectiveness of the treatment. However, in some patients, experience suggests that GNRH analog before HIFU treatment can allow treatment done effectively. However, a rebound adenomyosis activities after the cessation of GNRH analog and HIFU treatment may lead to early recurrence. So this is very important because if you give GNRH analog, the uterus shrinks. And then when you do HIFU, we are worried that the recurrence rate of the, uh, high, of the adenomyosis may be bigger. So uh, in my mind, if the adenomyosis is not big, I think we treat without the GNRH before HIFU rather than give HIFU, uh, rather than give uh, GNRH before the HIFU treatment. So 
What about unmarried women with adenomyosis? This is another, que another question. So we are seeing younger and younger patients with adenomyosis. They are not married and they have adenomyosis. They are in severe pain and they have got a lot of bleeding. They get admitted for blood transfusion. Can we do HIFU to prevent the progression of the disease? Now I have got this example, this 23-year-old uh, lady, single. She, told, she, she was told to have fibroids. Her period is irregular two times a month and with severe dysmenorrhea and normal flow. She had a laparotomy uh, uh, in 2018 for cyst, but no cyst was seen, only a, an appendicectomy was done. Examination shows the uterus was 14 week size and there was a large ad adenomyosis in the posterior wall measuring 4.9 times 6.4 centimeters. The ovaries had small cysts. Then this is how it looked. This is the adenomyosis she had. So we, we had a long discussion and we thought that this patient will benefit from HIFU. So we did HIFU and this is what we did. We ablated the, uh, the, the, the adenomyotic lesion. As you can see, we always leave a margin, safety margin around. And this is the endometrium. We didn't touch the endometrium. And this was the uterus uh, three months after the treatment. Uh, the uterus has shrunk. And when we measured uh, the volume, there was a volume reduction of 51%. At the beginning here, the volume was 945 centimeter cube, and here is 239 centimeter cube. So reduction of 51%. My only wish is that this patient will, the uterus will remain small. So I'm now trying to encourage her to actually put in a marina until she gets pregnant, until she gets married, so that uh, this other adenomyosis that we're left behind will not uh, bleed and then cause the adenomyosis to recur. So uh, these are my last few slides. And you, you all must understand that there's, uh, there's, the uterus has got a volume and the average volume varies in this study from 50, 15 to 56 centimeter cube. In fact, for a lady who is from between 37 to 90, uh, 39 years of age, the median volume is actually about 46 to 80 uh, centimeter cube. Uh, the, I, I'm saying this because uh, when we, when we uh, do surgery, when we, when we do the high food treatment, we tell the patient that the, we are aiming to reduce the uterus to about this kind of size, 80, maybe 100 cc. So this is the list of patients that I've done uh, in the last uh, eight months. We have done 82 cases and we are compiling the data. Hopefully in the next seven or eight months, I'll be able to come up with a paper to show you all exactly what my experience is uh, on patients with adenomyces. This adenomyces, I've got another 81 patients who have, uh, who have whom I've done fibroid. Now, I'll just close the discussion with one case uh, report. This is a 38-year-old lady noted to have adenomyosis before a second pregnancy. Adenomyosis started getting bigger during the pregnancy. She was given generation analog, and then Mirina was placed in 2019. It was increasing the last six months from three centimeter to eight uh, to five centimeter. She has some pain in the legs and also on the right side. Her periods is prolonged, and she's gaining a lot of weight with the Mirina. So this is how it looked. This is the uterus before HIFU. This contrast MRI, HIFU, uh, contrast MRI, contrast MRI. Pre-HIFU, the volume was 287. And then this is post-HIFU. This is ablation done. And post-HIFU, the ablation, the volume was 133 in three months. So reduction was about 53%. And I'm, I'm now seeing all my patients back. My Now my patient, my first patient is about eight months. Uh, one thing I realized is that after giving... Uh, uh, what do you call as a uh, uh, generic analog, the reduction is actually very good. It comes down. But after the after they get their periods, it rebounds. It becomes a bit larger. So because what happens is the generic analog as well as the HIFU brings down the uterus to a very low time. But it but once the patient is bleeding, the uterus is filled with blood and so the size becomes bigger. And then I think it will become smaller after that. So this is my experience now. So in conclusion, Adenomyosis is a very difficult problem. It is more difficult, especially when a patient wants to conceive. HIFU can be used in both patients who want to conceive and those who want just relief of symptoms. Studies have shown that success rate in reducing menorrhagia and this menorrhagia is up to 85%. I will be able to give my uh, success rate in maybe another six months time. And not all adenomyosis cases are the same. Some ablation are easy and others are difficult. Um, as opposed to fibroid, fibroid generally, if they are avascular fibroids, they are generally quite easy. And hybrid and HIFU is a good option for patients who want to retain their uterus. Thank you. I don't know whether I went overboard or not. Back to you, Ampan. Thank you so much, uh, Seoba. So maybe we have uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes to discussion and also uh, answer the question, but uh, sorry, now is no uh, 
question from our audience. Maybe uh, let me ask you some questions. Where is Olalik? Maybe we can uh, come to Joy and discuss together. Olalik, I'm here. Maybe you also have a, a lot of question to uh, Selva. So the first one is, uh, I think in the case that uh, have a abnormal uterine beating, like a, a you mentioned also, like mentioned. So the problem we also uh, heard many, many times that how you can uh, like a uh, rule out the malignancy or sarcoma, also endometrial cancer. So that means in case that you have a uh, abnormal uterine beating, actually you should uh, prove uh, like an uh, endometrial cancer by endometrial sampling or fractional killer touch and also uh, how about the mass of uterine mass that you quite sure that is not a uh, cancer. Like uh, the last case you mentioned it is, I think it's six months or some, 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 something and it increased inside 50% uh, is maybe is quite a uh, is a point of discussion also. How about your opinion? Um, okay. Um, I, I think what you want to know is what is the possibility that the patient may have cancer yes, when we are doing high food? Abnormal uterine beating. I think yes. we should uh, prove before or not, like uh, under uh, individual sampling or fractional killer touch. And in case that myometrial my mass, like a fibroid adenomyoma, how you make sure that it's not cancer? Yes, I, I, you're, you're perfectly right. In fact, um, when we assess a patient for HIFU, we want to exclude malignancy. Uh, endometrium is one. And the other one, we want to make sure that the mass, which is the, the fibroid, whether it could be a leomyosarcoma, that is very difficult. Now, endometrial cancer is easy. We can, we can do hysteroscopy, we can do endometrial sampling, we can do uh, hysteroscopy and uh, DDNC. And in fact, one patient, I, that's exactly what happened. The patient was referred to me for, for uh, HIFU. Uh, she was, she's actually a doctor some more. And uh, we looked at the MRI and we didn't like it. We, we saw that the endometrium is quite thick and also ultrasound showed the endometrium. So we took her for uh, DDNC and it turned out that she actually has endometrial cancer. And uh, then we had, we had to take her for surgery. Uh, so the, um, as far as uh, leomyosarcoma, that is very difficult. Now, we do MRI and MRI leomyosarcoma has got certain features because we also put contrast and with that, we, we try to look for evidence whether it is it could be a uh, uh, leomyosarcoma or not. If there's any suspicion, then we will do surgery. We won't do high food. But this is one question that I also asked uh, Professor Zhang Lian when I first was introduced to high food. What happened if inevitently, say the patient actually has leomyosarcoma and we do high food, what, what will happen? I think in my mind, nothing will happen. What, what will probably happen is that the, the fibroid will not shrink and the fibroid will remain or even in fact start growing, then we know that it's actually a leomyosarcoma and then you go and do surgery. Because this, the energy is given within the fibroid, I don't think it's going to affect the, the, the prognosis of the patient because the ablation is done within the uterus. So that, that's, that's in my mind, but I don't think anybody can give you an answer on that. Um, but that's why we follow the patients up to see whether the fibroid is shrinking. If it follows, it keeps shrinking, then it's very unlikely that it could be leomyosarcoma. Okay. Uh, Professor Selva, I have a question. So can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So uh, do you have the experience, uh, the surgery after the high food? Because sometimes we know that uh, after we do the high food for fibroid, but it's not effect. Mm -hmm. So we do the surgery? Yes. Um, I mean, in my series of 163, I still haven't done uh, what you call as a, a surgery for my patient uh, because I'm still following. I'm still very early. But I have had the experience of operating on one patient who had high food done in a different country about two years ago. She had adenomyosis. She wanted to get pregnant because we haven't started high food. So she went to a different country to do high food. And after that, uh, after one and a half, she was well. Uh, uh, after the after the high food, she was well, uh, bleeding re reduced. 
uh, her, her pain reduced, but later the pain came back. So I had actually got to go in and do a laparoscopic hysterectomy. It was a very bad adenomyosis case. So as, as I said, adenomyosis is actually can be quite difficult, especially in patients who want to get pregnant. And, uh, so, uh, and in my mind, what I think is that if the patient wants to get pregnant and we do HIFU, they must try to get pregnant as quickly as possible after the treatment. They cannot just sit around and wait for years because it's going to, it, it's going to come back. So I like patients who actually don't want to get pregnant because we can put Mirina and then we, we can at least have some success. Rate. Our aim is actually not to remove uterus in young patients. If they want to remove later in life, fine. If we can delay the, the, the hysterectomy by five years, six years, it's, it's good for them, you see. So that is, that is basically the concept. But when they come to get pregnant, in my mind now that I'm doing it for the last eight months, I think after the uh, GNRH wears off, they have to either get pregnant on their own or by IVF. Uh, as, as quickly as possible, because I think whatever we have left behind has got a possibility of coming back in the future. I have uh, one more question. Uh, how about your life after you have a high food? <laughs> <laughs> because, be, because we know that uh, when you do the high food, maybe it takes a longer time than operation, right? Yes. How about your neck? How about your finger? Yes. <laughs> Um, I will tell you this, uh, before HIFU, I was doing a lot of laparoscopic surgeries and I have the same problems. Rotator cuff, my shoulder is now giving me a problem. Um, my legs are cramping up. HIFU, I sit around, sit down and, uh, and do, but it takes longer. You're right, it takes longer. Uh, a laparoscopic myomectomy uh, for a four or five centimeter fibroid, I can probably do it in one hour, maybe one hour, 15 minutes. HIFU can take up to two hours, sometimes even three hours, sometimes vascular fibroid. And I have got this pain in the neck because when we are looking at the screen all the time, we are concentrating. I have got shoulder pain and neck pain. So these are things that, that, that I'm learning. And I've talk, spoke to my spine surgeon. He said, keep exercising when you're doing the haifu all the time so that your <laughs> neck is always supple. And then go swimming, he said, so that your neck will be. Uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages. The, the sense that, the, the of course, uh, this is less physically strenuous. Uh, mentally, it is very very taxing because i'm new i'm, I'm I, I when i started i'm i started from zero so i have to concentrate i have to make sure there's no complication i make sure i select my patients well so it's a lot of work uh, so when you start is the same thing you will you will you will have a lot of tension because we, have, we are surgeons uh, laparoscopic surgery we have been doing for years we are good at it we can we we, we, we can do it so it's a, this is a completely new field it is something like starting from scratch and then you have to learn your way to build up. So it's a lot of tension, a lot of pressure. And, but I think the benefit is a lot for the patient. Patients are very, very happy actually, but especially my uh, fibroid patients are very happy. They come, they do it and then they go off and the, 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 the symptoms get less and they are well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, old, and adenomyosis also, as long as I can help a certain percentage of patients, I'm quite happy because I, I don't expect to help 100%. But if I can help those patients who are not getting pregnant to get pregnant or those patients who don't want to get their uterus removed uh, to keep their uterus and reduce their pain and reduce their bleeding, I'm quite happy. So I think in that way, uh, we are doing service to the patient. So how about the learning curve? We know that uh, when you do the laparoscopy, it takes a long time for the yeah. learning curve. How about Haifu? I, 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 it took me uh, 50 cases before I could say wow. that I will be, I will, I am actually okay to do it. It took me 75 cases before I was doing it by myself. So it, it is not, not as simple as you think. It, you, it, you may be able to pick up laparoscopy faster than HIFU. The reason is because there's a lot to learn in HIFU in, because you need to know a lot of things. And I had uh, a doctor from China who came down, Dr. Huang came down and sat with me for three months and I made sure we have enough cases. So, and, and I did, uh, I think um, almost 60 cases with her. The first 50 cases she was sitting next to me and I was doing with, with her. The next 10, 15 cases she was remote. She was assisting me remote. Then after that, uh, Chong Ching was re assisting me in a remote basis. In the remote basis means they're actually watching me doing, and then I'm also talking to them on WeChat. And we ask, I ask them advice and then I'll do. Then they tell me actually you're good, already. why don't you do yourself? I said, okay, okay, then I start doing. So the last uh, 50 cases, I've been doing it by myself. So it has got a long learning curve. Don't think that you can pick it up 
so easily and you you have to be diligent because you don't want complication this is a new treatment we want to make sure that the the complication rate is almost zero so it will take time it will take time for you to learn uh, the 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 technology it's not not as easy as you think yeah okay. i think so so uh, the one that uh, i i saw many many mri that you uh, investigate for your patient actually is need or not to investigation before uh, high food um the the one most important investigation for high food is mri now the biggest like yes that. mri is a must the reason why is a, is is important is because ultrasound is not very clear you all know and we know especially abdominal ultrasound we all know transvaginal ultrasound is very clear but abdominal ultrasound is always not clear so you will have your mri next to you and you will correlate the mri with the ultrasound so the mri and the ultrasound you correlate you measure you know where your your sometimes you be so blur where the fibroid margins are so the mri is very important so mri is there in front of me all the time and i know exactly where i'm shooting because i can see the mri in that particular level so mri is a must no mri you can do uh, high foo yeah. then you have other tests you have some blood some some tests that we do but that is the most important test and the most expensive test before you do high foo for laparoscopic surgery i also don't do mri for my surgery yeah. case i just yeah. carry on and do the surgery you know so it's not even in multiple fibroids we just go and look for it and maybe in during the operation we do ultrasound to look for the missing fibroid but here you need the mri yes because uh, everyone think that that we need the mri to uh, distinguish or to see uh, maybe much better than uh, ultrasound so someone is just wonder that uh, the mri guide to high foo is maybe uh, can uh, describe or can see uh, maybe much better than uh, ultrasound guide high foo what do you think because you didn't mention about the uh, advantage or disadvantage between the MRI and other South Kai about this, yeah. uh, this part? Yeah, that, that is true. There are actually two things. The first is that uh, I have never had the chance to go and actually sit and watch an MRI based high I'm not just listening to other people. In fact, I wanted to do that because I cannot tell bad about something that I have not done. It's not, not fair, you know. But MRI based high food has been in my country for the last 15 years and the, the hospital that is doing it is the university hospital they only done i think 40 or 50 cases in the last 15 years now why is it so few cases there must be some problems that i think the main problem is because mri although the the clarity is very very clear to 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 see mri the when we are, when we there is no live uh, uh, imaging you cannot shoot and do the MRI at the same time. That is the, that is the biggest problem with MRI, I think. Uh, because you, once you, when you're shooting the, uh, the beam, the MRI is not on. You only do it after. Whereas in ultrasound-based HIFU, we are looking at the uterus while it's shooting. The patient just cough, your focal point moves, and it's so dangerous, it can be in the bowel already. So because of that, we can be a little bit more aggressive when we do MRI based HIFU. I mean, when we do ultrasound based HIFU, I can put the focal point very close to the endometrium or very close to the serosa because I'm holding it. If the patient moves, I can stop immediately. You cannot do that in MRI. MRI, you need a very safe margin. Say, if you want, you might want to be 20 or maybe 30 centimeter from an important structure and then put your focal point there. And then you start shooting and then you 30 second. 20 to 30 seconds, you got you don't know what's happening inside. You, they have got something called temperature mapping. So that is a diff, that is a disadvantage. That's the reason why MRI based HIFU never did well. I'm sure it didn't do well in, in Thailand as well. It's available, but nobody sells. The second reason is that MRI based HIFU is done by a radiologist. Doctors, gynecologists never want to send their patient to a radiologist to do to do to do. See, you want to keep your patient yourself. So that may be another reason why MRI didn't do well. Whereas here. Uh, high foo, you can do it. You are a gynecologist, you can do it. Ampan, you can do it. Ulrich, you can do it. If you can do ultrasound, you can do the the high foo, uh, the high foo, so you can keep the patient to yourself. That may be the second reason. So, um, uh, so I can, I, I've got no accessibility to go into the MRI room. The radiologist will not allow me to do. So that may be the second reason. But uh, I mean, after doing for so many months now, 
Uh, I think that most important thing is the power that we can put into the tissue is very high, as well as we can see what we are doing. I think that's the basic approach. Of course, we have a very obese lady. You put the ultrasound beam, you can't see anything. It's very, very blurred. Then you have to use your MRI, MRI to help you to guide. But in teen patients, you can see everything very clear. The MRI is still there to guide you. So uh, I think maybe we have a, a few of uh, one or two questions. The time is maybe uh, over. So the one is, uh, you did mention about the contraindication, but you mentioned a little bit about the uh, uh, adhesion or scar or something. Now, so that means uh, in case that previous surgery, very common like a senior section, uh, is, is a contraindication or not? No, um, I didn't actually talk, talk about contraindication. But today I was talking about adenomyosis and not high food. There are several contraindications when you do high food. Uh, the first contraindication is uh, is that the fibroid must be not so vascular if you're doing fibroid. So that's the reason why we do MRI, we do contrast MRI. If the contrast MRI show that the fibroid is full of blood, then the high food will not work because the energy when you put inside the blood will take away the energy. So that is one contradiction. It's another reason why we do MRI. We want to see whether the fibroid is a vascular fibroid or a non-vascular fibroid. So that is for fibroids. The second, second contraindication is, of course, if there is different surgery. A cesarean section is not a problem because cesarean section is very unlikely that you have anything attached to the uterus. If you have previous myomectomy, if you have previous adenomyomectomy or uh, severe endometriosis, then we are looking for any uh, additions of the bowel to the uterus at the area where we are going to shoot. But generally, it is not. Most of the time, there's no additions. Another problem is when they have many scars. If they have a lot of scars in the abdomen, firstly, the ultrasound beam will not show your lesion well. Secondly, you must be very careful that the energy will be absorbed by the skin and cause skin burn. So you've got to be more careful. You've got to do it slowly and more carefully. It's not a contraindication, but it is something that we need to be careful about. And another contraindication is, of course, if the patient cannot lie down for a long time. On, on the, we, 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 when we do high food, before that, we, we test them. We put them on the, on the machine and see that we are going to lie like this for two hours. Are you okay? And although they are under sedation, they still must be okay. They must be cooperative with you. They say they can't lie down, then we can't do. So these are, these are some of the contraindications uh, to, do, to do high food. But generally, most of the time, we can, we can uh, uh, do high food. Uh, sometimes I reject patients. So for example, the uterus is too big. We had one lady uh, recently we did. She has a 30 centimeter fibroid. It was right up to the 60 sternum. And I said, I don't want to do this. She doesn't want to do surgery. She's been keeping it for years. She's 42 years old. She's single. She's keeping it for years. She's a subserious fibroid. So she's got no symptoms. So she's happy. But ultimately, she said, we, I want Haifu. I, I got no, I, there's no other choice. So after discussing with Chong Ching, we decided to do her. And we did only half. We said we only do the lower half first. So we do the lower half first and let the uterus shrink and then we do the other half because doing on the upper half is very dangerous. It is very close to the nerve. You may have nerve injury. So this, these are options. So I think uh, not all patients, but some patients are pedunculated fibroid we can't do. Pedunculated fibroid, the reason is if you do, it breaks off, it can go into the, into the skin. In fact, just now I did one lady with a pedunculated fibroid that we didn't want to do because it's too dangerous. sub fibroids, very large sub fibroid, it will take a long time to absorb because there's no blood surrounding the fibroid. So it, it, you can do, but you must explain to the patient, it will take maybe two years to, to, to come down slowly shrink. The best are the intramural fibroids, maybe six, seven, eight centimeters or multiple fibroids. So this, these are some of the things, some of the contraindications. So, but generally the contraindications are much less than if you go for MRI. MRI, the contraindications are even greater because of the safety margin. Okay, I think we have uh, two questions from the audience. I think the last two questions. Uh, how many bowel injury and nerve injury in HIFO? I think from your silly, you have no light, but uh, from the series of- Yeah, there, there is one study, one big study. Uh, big, that big study shows that the bowel injury is only two per 100,000. That per 10,000, sorry, two per 10,000. Uh, nerve injury, I cannot give you the, the, the figure, but it's also very, very low. It is probably one per, less than 1%, 0.1%. Um, mild nerve injury is possible, 
because they, those are transient ones, but the permanent ones are the one we are we are worried about. So it is actually very very uh, uh, low, and we know which patients will have a higher chance of nerve injury. The uterus is very large. Uh, on the if the fibroids are on the lateral side, on the left side and the right side, those those fibroids we are very dangerous because those are the places where the sciatic nerves are. So when you ablate, then it, it can get affected. So to the 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 uh, they, I have got a slide that tells all the complications, but offhand I cannot tell you, but it's less than one percent the nerve injury. So the last question is how cause of the high flu? I think everyone like to know. Uh, I'm not allowed to say I'm, I'm not allowed to say what is the cost of the machine, but the machine is very very expensive, very expensive. especially when you when you buy it overseas. It's very expensive. Um, it is comparable to a MRI based high food. If you know the cost of an MRI based high food, then it's about that kind of price. Um, the advantage is that um, the backup is very good. The the, the company that's selling it. Have got very good backup. They will, they will, they will, uh, they will teach you until. So when you're buying, you're not only buying the machine, but you're buying their service, the, 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 the what they call the teaching, the module, all that. Yeah, you can contact them. You can call them anytime. So that is that is that is why it is very very expensive. So uh, cost you can ask Kolari to call. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I, not, I, I'm uh, not allowed to say the cost. The Me cost too. Be, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I'm but, not allowed uh, to. <laughs> how much the patient that pay a relate for, yeah. for the one in, in, in my country the cost to the patient is about uh twenty five to thirty thousand ringgit. That is about six ten four six about six thousand USD to USD. about eight thousand USD around that okay. kind of figure. About eight uh, seven thousand five hundred USD. That's that's a Malaysian cost. Of course, mm -hmm. in other countries it may cost more. Singapore it costs three times more, I think, and uh, in Hong Kong also it costs three times more. I think the cost is not the cost of the machine. The machine cost is the same where, wherever you go. It's the doctor's fees and the and the and the, and the, you know rental and all those all those things. In Malaysia it's a little bit cheaper because. Our our doctor's fees is actually very very low in Malaysia, so we we could do it with that with that kind of figure. I don't know. I know there is a machine in 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 uh, Thailand. I think your charges are about the same as us, or maybe even slightly lower. I think in Thailand. Okay, I think the time is already over. Maybe uh, more than uh, ten minutes. So thank you so much, uh, Sewa, and also uh, Doctor Oralik for your great uh, dedication and contribution to uh, THEE and also teaching at uh, many webinar. Thank you so much. I think everyone is uh, uh, happy to, to join and more understand uh, about the high food. And maybe we can uh, have more webinar about high food and get more uh, knowledge Maybe uh, from your series, maybe more than a lot of people that join, and you can get more uh, about the income uh, or the outcome of the your treatment. Okay. So okay. I think uh, this time is already over. I, I have uh, have to thank you everyone to join, and also uh, Haifu from China that for our good partner and sponsor from uh, this uh, webinar. So last but not at least, I'd like to invite all of you to join uh, the TGMED International Hybrid Catholic Workshop uh, 2022. Now, so we uh, start on Wednesday 23rd to uh, 25th, but uh, for the webinar and allow for the our international or uh, overseas uh, participants to join via the uh, Zoom is the 23rd and 24th. And the 25th is set, uh, for the Kadwik workshop for our domestic patients because of uh, for the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we just uh, keep only a uh, Thai people. So invite you guys uh, to join uh, on 23rd and 24th. So the topic is actually we have a, a live surgery every year, but now we, we 
uh, invite our speaker to join with uh, two hours of every uh, key, uh, like uh, our magnetic uh, speaker, every three hours period. Nah. So they will uh, give us about the uh, uh, theory, maybe uh, half hours, and also one and a half hour, they will show us a long uh, edit video. Nah. And we will discuss it look like a life surgery. So I think uh, everyone to join, we will uh, to, to see a long edit video from our guest speaker, like Alala Masaki Ando, and also Halu Dov in the back. And furthermore, we have a short, uh, like a one hour speaker also. So hope everyone can join and also uh, can uh, registration uh, to our website or from uh, QR code that show now. So, and also we got uh, another next next uh, webinar in the next month but now we still not uh, plan for all of you but we will show you later okay thank you. on 27 27 i think it's about uh gns analogs or maybe uh, from uh you know, or something like that. It's a medication for treatment of dermatosis so in and it will be uh, Thai version. So uh, our teaching webinar and also uh, international workshop now is will be uh, English version uh, in 23rd and 24th. So kindly invite you to, to join. So I think uh, the time is already limit. Thank again everyone, uh, Ola League and also uh, Selva and every participant that to join. Thank you so much. สวัสดีครับขอบคุณครับอาจารย์สวัสดีครับโอเค okay, bye 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 ไม่ทันเหรอ <laughs>